Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bible College. Really exciting to be here tonight. What a privilege to be able to speak tonight. I really count this a, an amazing opportunity, um, and I don't take it lightly, the opportunity to speak in a forum like this, and I'm not going to be like Mark and struggle for hours to open with one hand, so I'm just going to do that quickly. There we go. Beautiful. But such a really is an amazing privilege to be up here tonight. Artie Kendall wrote this statement. He said, why study theology? Because theological mindedness, assuming that it is centered on sound teaching and true spirituality, is the best remedy against being blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Just this amazing quote as I was reading um, one of R.T. Kendall's kind of systematic theologies in preparing for this and just realizing that when we engage with the Scriptures, when we engage with God's Word, actually we are giving uh, a, an opportunity for our thinkings to be transformed by Jesus. And I think it's such a key thing that we have to do as believers is allow God to transform us from the inside out. Is that good? So tonight we're going to get stuck in as uh, Kate spoke, Kate spoke on the Exodus, this incredible book in the, the second book of the Old Testament, the Old Testament filled with amazing stories of God moving, of God's power, of God's grace, of God's goodness, and I really would encourage you, get stuck into those the stories of the plagues, get stuck into the, the story of the Exodus, of them leaving Egypt, of all of these things, they, all of these stories have a, a of they, as a Wayne put so beautifully last week, he said, don't dismiss the action story for the sake of hearing the, um, for the sake of finding the symbolism in the story. I think sometimes we can go searching for symbolism and not actually understand the significance of what God um, was doing with those specific people at this, at that specific time. So go read the stories through that lens. But tonight I get the privilege of speaking on redemption, on, on what God was doing as a mirror to what God was doing with the Exodus. We're going to look a little bit about at the concept of redemption and then take out some key thoughts out of different moments in the story of Exodus, chapter 1 to chapter 18, the covenant with Moses we're going to be looking at a little bit next week. Um, in, in Exodus 5 verse 1, it says this, this very simple line, um, it says, he says to Pharaoh, Moses says to Pharaoh, he says, let my people go. And that is the big theme of chapter 1 to chapter 18, is God declaring over Israel, let my people go. And in the same way, when Jesus was born and died on the cross, he shouted this statement, he said, it is finished. In other words, he was saying, let my people go. You see, the Exodus is this beautiful mirror of who Jesus is to us today. It's, this, it's, it's a story of a, a nation who, who was known for their, um, was known as the people of God. Um, in some scriptures, it says actually that they, um, God would refer to them in his scriptures as the son of God. He would speak about Israel as the son of God. And, and what he was doing is he was removing them from captivity. The Exodus was the beginning of a new covenant with God's people. Up until that time, as we spoke on last week, they had been living in the covenant of Abraham. And the Exodus was the beginning of God establishing a new covenant with his people where he would put in place the Ten Commandments and various other laws that would then take them on a, a many, many year journey toward us now being here and knowing Christ. It was the, in, in the same way that we look at Christ and the crucifixion as the beginning of our covenant with God. So the same way God began the exodus with Israel, so the day that Jesus was born, our new covenant began. The story of our new covenant began. And, and so what I'd love to bring out today is the same way that, that, that Israel's exodus or Israel's redemption from captivity in Egypt was the, the, the cornerstone of their covenant with Moses, so our redemption in Christ is the cornerstone of our covenant with Jesus. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit. The Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, once God establishes His, his covenant with Moses, he, start, he would mention it over and over again through the Old Testament writers, reminding His people of what He had done for Israel, the way that He had taken them out of Egypt, in the same way that we have to constantly remind ourselves of how Jesus has redeemed us, has brought us into salvation, so that we can live a life that brings glory to God. You see, if we don't remember what Jesus has done for us, we quickly start to slip out of where, what God has got for us. I love in Psalm 77, it'll be on the, the screen behind me, verse 16 to 20, it says, When the waters saw you, O God... When the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. 
The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightning light, lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. You see, what the writer is doing here is he's reminding the people as they worship of what God had done in the Exodus. He's reminding the Israelites, he's reminding God's people of how he poured out his power and his grace and his life to them so that they would remember and so that they would respond to the goodness of God, so that they would obey the God in heaven. In Jeremiah 7, 21, it says this, it'll also be behind me, it says, For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt... I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. And I love that opening line, for in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. You see, God is calling them to obedience because of his goodness. God is calling them to obedience because he's, he's reminding them once again, this is what I did for you. Obey me. Bend your knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Understand who he is and respond to him. One of the, um, the plagues that Kate referred to, the 10th plague, tells of a, a moment which is known as Passover. And what, what happened in the time is Moses went to, the, um, went to Pharaoh. He said, every one of your firstborn sons will die unless you set the people free, as Kate spoke about. And, and Pharaoh didn't respond. And so what God did was he sent this plague of death to all the firstborn sons. But what's amazing is he said to the people of Israel, he said to them, take a lamb slaughter that lamb, take the blood of the lamb and put it above the doorposts. And when the angel of death or the angel of God's wrath would come over the door, it will see the blood of the lamb and it will pass that door. And in the same way we speak today, we understand that actually Jesus is that lamb that was slaughtered for us and his blood has been painted not on the doorposts of our homes, but on the doorposts of our hearts so that when the wrath of God comes on judgment day, it will pass over us. Why? Because we have a, a, a savior who was our atonement. Jesus is our Passover. And so the first portion of the Exodus that we're going to be looking at this evening and paralleling it to Jesus is the Passover. The, the Jewish people celebrate Passover to this day. And actually what's so fascinating is that when Jesus was crucified, the festival of Passover was busy happening. And so what I find so profound about God is that He is so clever in His timings and in, his, in his, his wisdom around how He does things that that thing would happen at the same time. Exodus 12, 13 says this, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Jesus is our Passover lamb. When the judgment of God, the angel of death, passes over the door of our hearts, God sees only the blood of the Lamb, His perfect, unblemished Lamb named Jesus. In Hosea 11 verse 1, Israel is described as the Son of God. And what we understand by that is that actually God sent His perfect Son to be the perfect sacrifice so that we could have atonement forever. You see, as we understand in the Old Testament, as um, this, this Passover moment was the first time that they started to use the sacrificial system to ask God for forgiveness of their sins. And so what starts to happen is we understand that actually, as God describes Israel as His Son, we now see later on in the New Testament that God sacrificed His one and only perfect son, the perfect Israel, the one who represents the perfect image of God's people, Jesus, the only perfect image, is sacrificed for us. Tonight, you might be asking yourself, well, atonement, that sounds like a very fancy word. What does that mean? Well, atonement very simply means this. Jesus, by his death, made up for the sins of the whole world. Jesus, by his death, made up for the sins of the whole world. In Romans 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 25, it says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness 
because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So what we understand is that actually God's Christ's sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood allowed us to receive relationship with God. There's a couple of key things we need to understand if we want to understand what atonement means and how powerful it is for us today. You see, these kind of theological concepts or words can often run away from us, but when we understand them, we are able to live lives that are more in love with Jesus. The reason we study the Scriptures, the reason we dig into theology is so that we can have a closer relationship with Jesus. Not so that we can get cleverer or know more things or have better answers. No, we want a closer personal relationship with God. In order to understand atonement, we must understand, number one, that sin is an infinite offense against God. It is rebellion to God at its core. You see, if we reduce sin in our minds to, oh, I accidentally lied to someone the other day, or, oh, I accidentally didn't pay my taxes, we reduce it to these momentary actions. When we reduce it like that, we lose the significance of actually sin at its core is rebellion to our Heavenly Father. When Adam sinned in the garden, what he was saying to God was he was saying, I don't need you anymore. And so when sin entered the world, we were ripped out of relationship with the Father. Number one, we have to understand that sin is an infinite offense against God. And number two, we have to understand that God is completely holy, which means that He cannot entertain sin. God cannot entertain sin. He cannot go, oh, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. I'll, I'll give them another chance. No, He cannot do that because He is completely holy. And so he had, to, he had to place a sacrifice that was completely holy to stand in the place of us, the sinners. In order to satisfy this debt, an equally infinite and complete sacrifice would have to be given. The debt, the, the sacrifice had to equate to the debt that needed to be paid. The covenant of the law shows us that man cannot do this. You see, when God gave the law to Israel, what he was doing is he was setting up salvation through Christ. He was giving them the law to say, you can try and achieve my love, but the reality is that you will never be able to do that. And so he sends them on a journey of understanding that actually the law shows us that we cannot achieve God's love, so we need a perfect and unblemished sacrifice to pay the debt that we owed so that we can have relationship with Jesus. That is the power of atonement. Number one, Jesus was our substitute. You see, we deserve the wrath of God because we sinned against God. We were the ones who committed that offense that removed us from the presence of God because God is holy. We were the ones who did that, but God in His mercy and in His grace sends a substitute named Jesus, His perfect unblemished Son, to be the substitute, to be the sacrifice that we should have been, He became. And that is such an incredibly powerful thing when we understand atonement because we have to understand that we fell completely short of the glory of God. But God sent one who did not fall short so that we could share in his righteousness. Number one, Jesus was our substitute. Number two, Jesus was our sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrifice that met the requirements of God's wrath. Therefore, we are completely paid for. You see, in the sacrificial system, they would repetitively sacrifice animals to atone for their sin, but Jesus was the one sin for all sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrifice that atoned completely, the sacrifice that met every requirement. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, because God was looking down on earth and going in the same way that he was looking down at, e at Israel in Egypt and seeing these people are in captivity and they are never going to get out. I need to send a miracle in the same way today or 2,000 years ago rather, he sent a miracle so that every son and daughter on this planet could be taken out of captivity. You see, when we understand the power of atonement, when we understand the power of that blood painted over the door of our lives, it transforms the way we see God and the way we relate to Him. Number one, He's our substitute. Jesus was our sacrifice. And number three, Jesus is our propitiation. Now, that's a really, really big word, but it very simply means this. It means to appease or to win the favor of. 
And what I find so profound about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, Jesus' atonement, is it does not only pay the debt, it wins the favor. And I don't know if you've ever imagined in a courtroom when a lawyer is giving his final kind of talk to try and get the person out of jail, and he, they, with everything inside of them, will try to win the favor of the jury so that they can get the right verdict. In the same way, when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, he won the favor of the Father so that you could live in the favor of the Father. You see, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him. But we live in the blessing of that sacrifice. In 1, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, that simple scripture is so incredibly powerful because it changes the way that I relate to God. No longer do I have to climb a ladder to achieve salvation, to re- achieve atonement. No, I am the righteousness of God because of Jesus. I'm the righteousness of God because God sent His one and only Son so that I could have that righteousness. So now that we understand a little bit more of what atonement is, we need to dig into a little bit of, well, why is atonement so important? Rolf Barnard, a theologian, said this. He said, be wrong on anything else, but be right on this. Understand what atonement is because it is such a key doctrine to living free in Christ. Romans 3.24 says, And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ. Number one, it tells us how we are saved. You see, we can use the terminology, I'm saved, I'm born again. But we have to understand how we are saved so that we can live in that salvation. It teaches us that our salvation is not by our works, but by His blood. It teaches us that actually it's His blood that is on the doorpost of our hearts. And because of that, we cannot achieve it. Number one, it tells us how we are saved. What is also so powerful about atonement is it separates Christianity from all other religions. Because atonement at its very core is a theological concept that teaches us that God did everything. If you look at the Exodus, if you look at the story of Moses, if you look at the story of how God removed the Israelites from captivity in Egypt, what's so profound about it is that actually Israel did nothing. They did absolutely nothing. Actually, if anything, they made it difficult to get out of Egypt. Actually, what you understand is that Moses didn't do very much. If you read the text, you understand, well, who appeared? God appeared to Moses. God instructed Moses with what to do to have those plagues appear. God challenged Pharaoh. God did all of the things that were necessary to do to remove them from captivity. In the same way, we as Christians, it is the only faith in the world where the God of which we speak did everything for us to have relationship with Him. In every other religion, there are tick boxes a mile long that you have to achieve to have relationship with the God of which you speak. We enter into relationship through the blood of the Lamb because it's painted on the doorposts of our lives. It teaches us that our salvation is secure. You see, when God took Israel out of Egypt, it was a sure bet. It was a sure thing. You see, even as Kate spoke, and she spoke about actually when God initiated the first plague, Well, actually, he knew what the last plague was going to be. See, we understand that Israel's redemption, Israel's freedom was a sure thing. And in the same way, our salvation in Christ, our atonement, the the washing away of our sins is is secure, not in me, it's secure in Jesus. And that transforms the way that I live my life. Number four, it shows us that God is both just and merciful at the same time. See, the Bible is filled with this reality. It's called truth and tension. When I say to you, well, God is completely just and God is completely merciful, that can be a challenging thing for us to understand. But we understand that in the Word, the Word is filled with truth and tension. And what atonement shows us both for the Israelite nation and for us today is that God is completely just in that He could not just get over sin, He needed a sacrifice that fulfilled it completely because He was completely just and completely holy. And so in Jesus, we see that He fulfilled the law completely. Every stipulation that the covenant of Moses put forth for the Israelites to, uh, to achieve, Jesus fulfilled. 
If you just go and start reading about all of the prophecies that were put out that Jesus had to fulfill and start reading as, as to how he achieved those prophecies, you start to understand how powerful Jesus fulfilling the entirety of the law is. Secondly, Jesus never sinned. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. His mercy was displayed in that he did not demand the sacrifice from us. He gave his one and only true son to be the sacrifice for us. Perfectly just, he did not abdicate any of his holiness, but he gave a sacrifice in his mercy so that we didn't have to do it. I don't know about you, but when I, used to, I start to understand this, I get excited about who God is. Number one, we read about the atonement, about the, the Passover. Then we jump from, from that to actually how the Israelites are brought into freedom from Egypt. And one of the key concepts here, and it's a concept that we would have heard of very often, but it is the concept of salvation, this deep theological truth in Exodus 12, 31 to 33. It says, then he summoned Moses and Aaron, this is talking about Pharaoh, by night and said, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said, take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. The Israelites' escape from Egypt is a beautiful picture of our salvation in Christ, set free from the grip of our captor. Now, you might be asking yourself tonight, well, okay, what is this captor that we have been set free from? What has salvation set us free from? Well, number one, our captivity is a lack of relationship with God. Outside of Jesus... We are outside of fellowship with God. In Genesis 1, when we read the account into Genesis 3 of Adam sinning, what occurs in that moment is that they, Adam and Eve are in perfect relationship with God. They are walking with Him in the cool of the day, and a moment later, through an act of, of disobedience, of direct disobedience to God, they are removed from fellowship with God. Number two, not only are we removed from fellowship with God, our captivity outside of Christ is that we are subject to God's wrath. There is a judgment day coming. If you read the scriptures, Jesus will come again, and at that time, he will call account to his people. And outside of Christ, we are subject to the wrath of God. Number three, what we should live in is God's holy pleasure, but we live in his righteous wrath. And number four, our captivity outside of Christ is that we are spiritually dead outside of him. You see, Ephesians 2 teaches us, as for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. You see, outside of Christ, our captivity, not so much a, a, an Egypt, but our captivity is a, 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 an absence of God and a spiritual death. And actually, another captivity that we live in is a reality that we, outside of Christ, are of the world. You see, not only are we dead spiritually, not only are we separated from God, but actually we start to live lives that are controlled and are, are permeated by the way that the world exists rather than the way that God exists. Why? Because of that separation. You see, when we understand every, our captivity, when we understand that we need salvation, it becomes all that more powerful. You see, atonement was the beginning of God's redemption of His people, taking them from death, from captivity, and moving them back to His original design, which we see in the book of Genesis. Well, actually, perfect relationship with God, walking with God, hearing His voice. And when we talk about salvation, we have to talk about a couple of key things that allow us to understand in depth what salvation is. Number one, we need to understand what we are saved from. And we've spoken a little bit about this. Firstly, our sin. Secondly, God's judgment. And thirdly, eternal damnation, eternal removal from the presence of God. Then we need to understand, well, how are we saved? The first key thought that we have to understand in salvation, number one, is that we are saved by grace through faith. Once again, completely done by God, entirely dependent on Him. Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, works, lest any should boast. You see, what God is doing is he's, he's exemplifying himself. He's glorifying himself because he is the only one that deserves glory for our salvation. 
Number two, we are saved through repentance. In Acts 26, 18, it says, To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me, in Jesus. You see, we receive salvation when repentance uh, it can often be understood as this, I just need to keep saying sorry for what I do wrong. And there is truth in that. There is truth in sharing with one another to, to see freedom come. But actually repentance at its core is to turn away from your old self and turn toward Jesus. You see, because we can't turn toward Jesus without turning away from something. And repentance is that very thing. It's turning from my old life, turning from my captivity, believing God, and turning toward His salvation. Thirdly, we receive salvation by believing. In Romans 10, it says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, God gives us the gift of salvation freely, but He calls us to participate in that salvation. How do we participate in salvation? Well, number one, understanding that it's completely through Him. Number two, repenting of our old ways. And number three, believing who God is, believing in His salvation, and living that out. And then thirdly, what are we saved for? You see, if we live in a, in a reality, and this is what started to, hap to happen to the Egyptian people, and I'll s get stuck into that a little bit later, but is they got saved out of captivity. God promised them the promised land, but they had to walk a little bit of a journey to get there. And you see, what started to happen is they started to lose sight of the destination, started to lose sight of what they were saved for, and they started to grumble. They started to lose the unbelievable power of what God had done in them. And in the same way, we as God's people have to understand what we are saved for. Number one, we are saved for eternal life in Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whomever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That scripture is not just a cool Christian um, key ring that you get to put on your keys. No, it is the power of God that whomever should believe would have eternal life. We are saved for perfect relationship with God. God wants us back in the garden. He wants to return us to His original design. That is fundamentally what redemption means. It means that I am being taken back to the place where I am supposed to be. I'm supposed to be with God in the garden in perfect relationship with Him. Number three, we are saved for righteousness in Christ. So we go back to that scripture in 2 Corinthians, we are the righteousness of God. You see, when we live in that righteousness, the power of God is present in the world in which we live. When we live in the righteousness that God has given us, we, we are saved to make God's glory known on the earth. In Ephesians 3.10, it says, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. You are saved. You are brought into salvation in Christ so that you can make the glory of God known on the earth. God gives us purpose, along with our freedom from captivity, along with the Israelites leaving Egypt, along with us leaving our captivity, God calls us to something to make His glory known on the earth. And lastly, God calls us to grow in godliness. He calls us to become more like Jesus. None of these things happen because we do things well. All of these things happen because we submit ourselves to the power of God. You see, Salvation is this incredibly powerful thing in that it is not simply a once-off moment. It is an ongoing freeing from captivity. You see, we receive salvation from Christ. It is a once-off moment where we go from being dead in our trespasses and alive in Christ, but then we go on a journey of salvation of becoming more like Jesus. You see, the 40 years in the wilderness could very quickly be understood as actually God wanted His people to understand who He was. And so what did he do? He sent them on a journey. And in the same way, we are called to a journey here on earth to become more like Jesus. So the first thing we look at is the Passover, which is God's atonement for us. Secondly, we look at the freeing from Egypt, which is the salvation that God brings to us. And then thirdly, and this I think is such a powerful one, is actually the moment of the Red Sea. They escape from Egypt. They run out. They, they, they've gotten out of captivity. And then they face a massive piece of water called the Red Sea. 
and God does a miracle. He parts the Red Sea, and what happens is these free people walk through the water, and what happens is as they get through the water, their old life, their old captivity, their old Egypt comes chasing after them, but what happens? The waters close, and their old life is washed away. It's this beautiful picture of what baptism is for us. You see, in the Exodus, we see this picture as in Matthew 28, it says, Go out and make disciples of all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The reason baptism is powerful is because the same way in Exodus, the same way it is a declaration of what God has done. You see, they were free. They had been taken out of Egypt. But it's almost as if God creates this moment to show them, actually, I've washed your past away. I've taken your past away. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. And I love that picture, actually, of how the Egyptians came chasing after the people of God, and in a moment, their past was washed away. It wasn't over a long period of time they had to keep running, keep running, keep running. No, in a moment, the the sea closed, and Egypt was washed away. In the same way, when we go into the waters of baptism, we are declaring in the spiritual, the old is gone, the new has come. You might be sitting here this evening going, well, what's the point of getting baptized? The point of getting baptized very simply is declaring what God has done through salvation in your life. It's almost, as you read the story of Exodus, you almost get the sense that God could have just done away with the Egyptians. The, The ground could have fallen out from under them. Anything could have happened to get rid of them. But he orchestrates this moment where, where Israel goes through the Red Sea as, as, a, as a, a picture of baptism in Christ, and their old lives are gone. It's the power of baptism. And then lastly, we read in the story of Exodus up to chapter 18, we read that actually Israel spent a lot of time in the wilderness. And for many of us, we might not understand this wilderness reality, and, but actually there's a beautiful parallel that we can make to the years that they spent in the wilderness to the lives we live today. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. See, a key word in that text is that word exiles. Chosen by God, but exiles in the world. In the same way, the believers, the Israelites, they had a promised land waiting for them. We know that when we are in Christ, we have a salvation that is waiting for us. We have a new heaven and a new earth that is coming when Jesus comes again. But we also understand that we have the fullness of God with us now. And so we live in this interesting um, space where actually it has come, but it has not yet come. We are in this intermediary phase between receiving the fullness of what God has, but also having God with us now. In the same way, the Israelites lived in the wilderness. You see, some significant things that happened in the wilderness is God sent a pillar of fire by night and a, a pillar of smoke by day. You see, they had divine direction. In the same way we live our lives now, we're in the wilderness. We are exiles in this world. We are not of this world. But we are given divine direction to live in this world. Why? So that we may bring the glory of God to this place. We live in the wilderness, but with a purpose. Another key thing that, that God does in the, in, the, in the wilderness is actually He gives them food supernaturally. And we read in the beginning of the Gospels, uh, and, and that He's quoting the Old Testament writers. He says, man shall not live on bread alone. You see, God is our provider. And so often in the wilderness, um, the Israelites lost focus of who their provider was. So what does God do? He sends manna from heaven. In the same way today, we don't trust in our earthly systems to provide for us. We trust in the provision of a heavenly father. It's such a powerful concept. And what did Israel start to do? They started to get bored of the food that God gave them. They said, you know what, if we're going to have to eat this every day, we might as well just go back to Egypt. Now we might hear that and go, That sounds a bit ridiculous. Why would you want to go back to Egypt? But we do that so often. God has called us out of captivity. He's provided everything we need for life and godliness. But for some strange reason, we want to go back to the old way we used to live. We go, yo, God will provide for me. He's my father in heaven. He has everything I need. And but 
but I'm sure I can make a plan in this area. You know, I'll trust God with my family, but with my finances, I'm not too sure. But actually, God has called us to live in the wilderness so that we can be a sign and a wonder to who He is. The Israelites were called to be a sign and a wonder in that space. And, but what they started to do was they started to grumble. And because they grumbled, it took a lot longer for them to get to the promised land. Now, we know Jesus is coming back. We know that we are called to live in this life, this Christian life that is, is parallel to the wilderness that they lived in. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, number one, will we believe wholeheartedly in the atonement that Christ has won for us? Number two, will we embrace and believe wholeheartedly the salvation that Christ has given us? Will we live the reality of actually the old has gone and the new has come? And will we allow the Scriptures to permeate us so that this Christian life we live now would bring glory to God, we would see the direction of heaven, we would follow God, we would follow that pillar of fire and that pillar of smoke on a daily basis, and that we would allow God to be our providers so that we can be a sign and a wonder to the world around us. You see, I don't believe that God calls us to... Um, to live on. He doesn't, he doesn't kind of send us out of our captivity and then go, now you're on your own. No, he teaches us, he gives us his salvation, he gives us his son so that we can live in relationship with him. When you go on reading the rest of Exodus, you see that actually they're given the tent of meeting, which is how the presence of God would go with them. But actually throughout the Exodus, you see that God is with his people. And I want to say to you this evening that you have been called out of captivity you have been given the life and the salvation of Christ, and God is with you. Trust Him, and you will walk in everything that He's got for you. Can I pray for us? Yeah, Father, I thank you tonight as we've engaged with your Word, God, as we've, as we've delved into your Scriptures, Jesus, as we've engaged with this incredible reality of your atonement, of your salvation, God, of your, the power of your baptism, God. Of, I pray, Father, that these things would become realities in our life, King Jesus. I pray that they would not simply be, be concepts that we understand, God, but heart realities that we would embrace on a daily basis, King Jesus. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in this room. I thank you for the hunger in the hearts of the people in this room to grow, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing through this Bible college. And I pray, God, that every Monday night as we sit here and engage with your word, God, we would grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Amen.